الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين والشمس وضحاها والقمر إذا تلاها والنهار إذا جلاها والليل إذا يغشاها والسماء وما بناها والأرض وما طحاها الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر ما لنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله Ayub, as he tried to give the introduction, he said, I'm going to be talking about uh, parenting and raising kids in uh, the 21st century but that's not what you're going to hear today um, because I'm someone who's definitely not qualified to be talking about that. So we have, mashallah, you know, some of my teachers here, the elders in the community, they have a lot more experience. Um, I'm a young father myself and I'm struggling like I'm sure most other parents are struggling. So if I was to sit here and give you advice and tell you do this, do that, I'm, I would be, I feel like a hypocrite because it's not working for me. I have very stressful days at home as I'm sure you all can relate to. Um, and I also considered or was asked to talk about maybe being obedient uh, to the parents, how to show respect uh, to the parents. But again, I was uh, quite a naughty child, so uh, I don't, I don't feel like me talking about that. Again, it's you know, sort of hypocritical. Um, and every family, no doubt, has their struggles. And I, with my own family and through my own upbringing, had my own struggles. Um, but what I want to do in this lecture is just give some short uh, advice and maybe share some points which I feel that can be beneficial to the youth and also maybe to young, fa young parents, you know, young brothers and sisters starting out their family. Um, so I just wanted to give some basic advice, inshallah, on, on those points. And first of all, I should start off by saying, as I'm sure many speak in, and you hear this all the time, but really... It's how I, when I thought about my talk, I thought about what advice do I need to give to myself? What advice do I need? And then I set about looking at these points and, you know, created this sort of lecture or this uh, advice, as I call it. So first of all, it's applicable to me before it's applicable to you. Uh, I'm saying it only to myself and then, inshallah, that my brothers and sisters can benefit. And the first point that came to mind and the first thing I thought about is we should all look, and the first thing we should all look at is our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And are we actually a role model within our own family? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Quran, Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara O you who have believed, addressing us, Addressing the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. Save, Allah starts with yourself. Save yourself and then Allah says, and your families from the fire. The fire of which whose fuel is men and stones. So the first thing that we should start off with, anfusakum, ourselves. And then our families. This should be the focus of every believer. This should be the focus of every parent. To first save yourself 
and then to save your family. We should be that first role model. We should be that first starting point. We start with ourselves and inshallah things will follow from there. There's no point telling our kids to pray and we don't even wake up for Fajr ourselves. There's no point telling our kids to pray and we never pray with them. We don't encourage them. We haven't even thought about how we're going to be enjoyable to them. But we always tell them, pray, 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 pray. And it's something that's nagging to them. They don't like it. We haven't thought about how can we make the prayer enjoyable. How can we set ourselves be our role model? Are we waking up for Fajr? Are we keeping the prayers on time? But yet we want our children to pray and pray. Again, the Qur'an. A lot of us, we send our kids to Madrasa. We send our kids to the mosque to go and learn the Qur'an. But how many times have our children seen us with the Qur'an in our hands? How many times have our children heard us reciting the Qur'an? If we are not reciting the Qur'an inside the house, if we are not picking up the Qur'an so our children can see, then how can we expect them to love the Qur'an? How can we install the Qur'an upon them? Rather, we ship them off to the masjid and, you know, one hour a day or a couple of hours a week and we think we've done a good job. No, look at yourself. Be that role model in your, in your, in your household. Again, many examples, anything good, charity, whether it be prayer, charity, fasting, we should be that example. How we behave really has the biggest impact on our children. How we behave has the biggest impact on our children, especially when they're young. They look up to us. We are their role models. We are what they want to aspire to be. So, Save yourself, prepare yourself, be that role model. And we see this in the Qur'an where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions the story of two orphan children in Surah Kahf. When Musa alayhi salam and Khidr alayhi salam, Adul Qadmain al Khidr alayhi salam, they go to this distant town in the middle of nowhere. And they find within this town a wall which is about to collapse. This random wall which is about to collapse and he, he restores this wall and he repairs this wall and then they go on about their journey. And when Musa alayhi salam was informed about why did he do this, Musa said, why, why did you do this? We went into this town, we asked these people to give us food. They didn't give us any food, they rejected us. But yet you came into this town and you fixed this wall. And Khidr alayhi salam, he told him why he did this. And he said, he said that he did one of the, the main reasons he did this, Allah says in the Quran, وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحَا So to give a background on the story, under this wall was what? What was under this wall? Who can tell me? A treasure. Naam, a treasure. And under this treasure, this treasure belonged to two young orphan boys. And imagine they were growing up in this town where no one wanted to even care for the guests. So it was an evil town. But Allah said, Musa and Khidr, to go and to go and repair this wall and keep it firm to protect this treasure for these two, two young orphans. And why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say that he done this? And their father was someone who was righteous. Their father was righteous. Imagine Allah is mentioning this story in the Quran. And Allah sent the two best people on the on, on the face of the earth at that time, Musa and Khidr. To go to some random town just to fix this wall to protect these two young orphans' treasures. Subhanallah, look at how they traveled and Allah sent these two people. Why? Just because their father was righteous. So, my dear brothers and sisters, us being righteous and us being that first role model and that first example, bi idhnillah will have that impact and that protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will send His protection to us. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he says, I used to pray nawafil at night when I would see my small children. It is said when he would see his small children, he would be praying to Hajjud at night. And then he would say, Wa kana abuhuma salih. He would recite this verse and he would cry. He would cry and he was saying, I am doing this for my children. I am doing this for you. Crying at night, praying to Hajjud, being righteous, so his children can be protected by Allah. And one of the Salaf, they would say, I pray. Then when I see my children, or I see my child in front of me, I pray even more. So our children are a blessing that we must protect, that are amana from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second point I wanted to touch upon, and it's applicable for the young and for the old, for those of us who still have parents alive, is the importance of obedience to parents. 
How can we want our children to be obedient and listen to us if we are disobedient to our parents? And our parents are unhappy with us. It doesn't work like that. First, you must fix your relationship with your own parents. And then inshallah, you will have blessings in the lives with your children. With your own children, you will see that they will be obedient to you. But you, if you are someone who is disobedient to your parents, or your parents are often unhappy with you, then you must look at yourself and fix that relationship. Many are the ayat that we can discuss in the Quran. Allah says He ordains that you worship Him and nothing but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, associating no partners with Him. And then after this, and to your parents do good. To your parents you are in order to be good to them. Allah says in the Quran. If any if one of them or both of them attain old age, then do not even say uff to them. Do not even say uff to them. Let us look at ourselves. I don't think there's one person in this room who hasn't at least said uff to their parents. But this is what Allah subhanahu is ordering you. وَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفْ Don't even say uff to them. Uff meaning just any form of, you know, oh, why, why, why are you saying that to me? Anything like that. This is what Allah says in the Quran. He puts worship to him as number one, and number two, obedience to the parents. وَوَصَّيْنَ الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ إِحْسَانًا حَمَلَتْهُ أُمُّهُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, we have, in, we have enjoined and we have commanded that إِحْسَان إِحْسَان is the utmost respect, the utmost good that you can do. This is what you should be doing to your parents. And again, there's many hadith, I'm sure you can all look at them. Um, but we don't have much time. But this was the second point. The importance of obedience to your parents. The third thing is, we have to understand that this world, my dear brothers and sisters, is a very short and temporary enjoyment. Very short and temporary. And that we will all one day return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And primarily, our life, our deeds, our aims in life, should be to please Allah and should be to attain Jannah. كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ Allah says, every soul shall taste death. There's not one of us here that will live forever. وَإِنَّمَا تُوَثَّوْنَ أُجُورَكُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ That indeed you will be, you will receive your rewards on the day of judgment. فَمَنْ زُحْزِحَ عَنِ النَّارِ وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةِ فَقَدْ فَازِ and that person, that person on that day who is removed from the hellfire or is distanced from the hellfire and entered into Jannah, فَقَدْ فَاسْ This is the true success. This is what we should be aiming for. وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاعُ الْغُرُورِ That this life, this world, is nothing except the enjoyment of delusion. It's a deception. We think that we're here forever. We're made to believe that by attaining the things of this world, we're going to be happy. And I'm not trying to say, my dear brothers and sisters, don't go after the dunya. I'm not trying to say, you know, live a poor life or have a, have a, have a miserable life. Don't worry about having a good car, having beautiful clothes, a nice house. No problem. No problem to aspire to all these things. But when these things are taking priority in our lives, when we find ourselves chasing the dunya and forgetting about Allah, when we find ourselves missing our prayers and instead focusing on trying to attain the things of this world, then we need to stop. We need to think, what are we doing? Really, what are we doing? When we're not going to be here forever, كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ Every one of us will taste death. And let us not think that because we are young, for those of you who are still young, that death is something which is far away. Who told you that you're going to live until you're 60, 70, 80? Did anyone give you that guarantee? It's a trick from the shaytan to think that we are here and we, you know, when we get older, inshallah, I'm going to be more righteous. I'm going to pray, pray more. I'm going to fast. I'm going to give charity. When I'm older, but now, you know, I'm young, I want to focus on obtaining as much wealth as I can or 
being as famous as I can or, you know, raising my status amongst my social circle. I don't want to focus on Islam, no. No one gave you that guarantee. So when we find ourselves doing this, we need to stop and we need to look at ourselves and we need to turn. أَلَمْ يَأْنِنِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنْ تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَمَا نَزَلَ مِنَ الْحَقِّ Has the time not come? Allah is asking for those who have believed to turn to Allah. أَلَمْ يَأْنِنِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنْ تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ That their hearts surrender to Allah وَمَا نَزَلَ مِنَ الْحَقِّ And that which we have revealed of the truth. Has the time not come? So when that time comes, my dear brothers and sisters, when we decide we need to change and we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my fourth, my fourth point is we need to look at our friendship, our social circle, those who we call our friends. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, الرَّجُلُ عَلَى دِينِ خَلِيلِهِ فَلْيَنظُرْ أَحَدُكُمْ مَنْ يُخَالِهِ that the man is upon the way of his friends. He is upon the path of his friends. So look carefully to whom you befriend. Look carefully to whom you call your friends. Look at your social circle very carefully. Because this will give you an indication of where you are heading and what path you are upon. And when you do decide to make that change and draw closer to Allah, then leave those friends who are dragging you down, my dear brothers and sisters. Leave those friends who you know if you hang around with them more, they're only going to bring you further down. And Allah will give you better friends than them. If you leave anything for the sake of Allah, Allah will replace it and give you something better. So, my dear brothers and sisters, don't get dragged down by those, by those around you and by those influencing you. Be that person who makes that change and who goes out and takes action. Find new friends. Find friends that will make you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who will remind you to pray. Don't hang around with those people who are not, not concerned about praying. Not concerned about Allah. وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِ فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكَ Whoever turns away from my remembrance, then indeed he'll have a wretched life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, It's not by chasing the dunya that you're going to find happiness. There's no happiness in chasing the dunya. الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَتَطْمَئِنُّ قُلُوبُهُمْ بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطْمَئِنُّ الْقُلُوبِ That is it not when the believing hearts they find rest in the remembrance and the mention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Indeed, in the remembrance of Allah, do the hearts find rest. Tranquility is by turning to Allah, by remembering Allah. Happiness is in Islam, following the way of Islam, following the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's true happiness. And the fifth and final point before I conclude is dua. Dua is the weapon of the believer. So whether my dear brothers and sisters, whether you be young or old, or whether you have a family or you don't, never ever forget to continually make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Always make dua to Allah that He guides you and keeps you steadfast. It's something that we do every single day as a believer. We are commanded to do it. إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ We say it in our prayers every single day. Guide us to the straight path. And we're not saying guide me, إِهْدِنِ No, إِهْدِنَا Guide us. We're making dua for the whole community. For all our families, for all the brothers and sisters in Islam. We're making dua as an ummah. Dua is the weapon of the believer. Make dua to Allah sincerely and never give up, never lose hope. Never think that my son or my daughter is too far away from Islam or I'm too wretched of a person, I've done too many sins. No, always make dua and turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is always wanting to hear, wanting to forgive. And with this I will end my talk. I will anything good I have said is from the mercy of Allah and anything bad I have said is from me or from the shaitan. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this blessing, to make this uh, gathering a blessed one and to unite us um, with him and with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the highest levels of Jannah and Fadaus. Jazakallah khair, As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. course that I developed about willpower. But can anyone tell me what willpower is? Because why on earth would my, why would this be a useful talk to have? Why would it be 
beneficial for us to talk about willpower. So does anyone know or have an idea <clears throat> what they think willpower is? What is willpower? Anyone know? Is it what, strength of what? Your ability to what? Lift a heavy object? Is that willpower? Okay, so you're throwing some things at me. Determination. Yeah? So we're getting there. Strength, determination. Is it, is it a outward physical thing or is it a psychological, mental thing? Yeah, it's psychological. So willpower is to do with the power of your mind. Yeah? But now a lot of people really don't know what willpower is. And that's the first problem. Right? Maybe they think that willpower is some sort of Jedi ability to focus on an object and then levitate it. This thing to actually move, right? I can sort of will something to happen just by the sheer force of my will. So a lot of people imagine willpower is some sort of mystical energy source that they can tap into. And that's not what, that's just mythology, right? That's just movies, right? So, from the point of view of psychology, the, the science of how our, how our mind works, willpower is de defined as your ability to resist, or it's defined as your ability to delay gratification. Yeah? No, I thought that might <laughs> Okay, so let me explain it simply, right? It is your ability to resist temptation. That's it. That's what real willpower is. So, as a human being, we have something we know from Islamic terminology. It's our nafs. Right? Our desires. Our passions. Our impulses. And how important do you think it is for a Muslim to be able to resist their passions and their desires and their impulses? Like a little bit important or very, very important? Like, I mean, think about it. Let's think about it this way. Let, let's think about it this way. What is it that Allah is going to weigh up for us on the Day of Judgment? What is it that Allah is going to weigh up for us on the Day of Judgment? What are going to be weighed? What's going to be weighed for us on the Day of Judgment? What? Our? Yeah, our what deeds? Our good deeds and our bad deeds, right? Yeah? Okay, so doing good deeds is pretty important. And resisting the temptation and the urge to do bad deeds is also pretty important. Let me remind you. Of when, uh, when you're in your grave, remember the description of the barzak? When a man will appear at the foot of the wicked, evil soul. And this man, the person in the grave will say, Oh, who are you? Because you look like you are bold and evil end. It's like you, you're, the way you look, looks like something bad is going to happen. And this man will say, I am your evil deeds. I am your evil deeds, and I only found you very quick to disobey Allah, and very, very slow to obey Allah. She said, I can give it to you. Whereas for the believer, the good person, he will say, oh, who are you? You are bold, a good end. It's like, you, you know, like something good's going to happen. He said, I'm your good deeds. I never found you except that you were very slow to obey, uh, very slow to disobey Allah and very quick to obey Allah. Right? So what is going on in this world? What are we faced with in this dunya? The Prophet wasallam said when he, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he created Jannah and Jahannam, he said to Jibreel, Ya Jibreel, go, look at my paradise and tell me what you think. So Jibreel came back. He said, oh Allah, anybody who hears about it, they will enter it. Then Allah surrounded it with hardships and trials and tests and difficulties. 
Then he said, now go and look at my paradise and tell me what you think. And Jibreel came back, he said, I'm afraid that nobody will enter it. And the same, he said, Jibreel, when he prayed to the hellfire, he said, Jibreel, look at my hellfire, tell me what you think. Jibreel came back, he said, Allah, anyone who hears about it, they will never go there. Then Allah surrounded it with temptations and ease and luxury. Yeah, he surrounded the hellfire with temptations and ease and luxury. Then he said to, he said to Jibreel, now go and look at my hellfire, tell me what you think. He said, I'm afraid that nobody will escape it. Right? So the ability, brothers and sisters... To delay gratification, the ability to resist your impulses, the ability to resist your desires is absolutely key to your whole life of being a Muslim. In fact, that's what life is, really. Life is a test. Will you obey Allah or will you disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So this subject is hugely important. It's a very, very important subject to understand how do we, are there things that we can do to develop our willpower? Now, what I want to talk, I'm talking about willpower from the point of view of, it, you know, modern psychology. What really they do under this umbrella of willpower is they bring together lots of things that we have in our tradition, but it just comes up under one umbrella of willpower. So I think it's very, very useful when you study this. And I want to start by referring to a very amazing study, just to give you an important, just to give you an insight from a general perspective, not only from a religious perspective, right? Not from we, only from the point of the, our deen, but a, I could say, you could say a broader perspective of human well-being, right? That how important this is, how important it is in terms of human success development. So there was a experiment, a famous experiment called the marshmallow experiment. You've probably seen YouTube clips of it, right? Right? Is they put these kids in a room and they put a table in front of the kids and they had a marshmallow on the table. And they said to the kids, you, if you can have one marshmallow now, right? But if you wait, okay, whatever amount of time they said, I can't remember, five minutes or whatever amount of time it was, you can have two. Interestingly enough, the experiment was not supposed to be about willpower. That wasn't the original purpose of the experiment. They were testing something else. I think they were testing about kids' honesty or, you know, the tactics they would use or whatever, right? So anyway, you can guess some kids waited. In other words, they delayed gratification. They waited, they delayed, right? They said, okay, I can wait. I won't eat that one marshmallow right now. I'm going to wait a few minutes and I'll get two. Right? And some kids, they couldn't wait. Oh, no. They couldn't wait even a few minutes. They, you know, they, the door was closed. They were left in the room. And a few seconds later, they took that marshmallow and they ate it. Right? So, that was the experiment. And they, you know what they were trying to do is study the techniques that kids would use to see how they could avoid temptation, you know, so some would pick it up and look at it and smell it and, you know, like some would not look at it, you know, they, they would turn away and not look at the marshmallow, right? Which is really interesting because that some of these are, are exactly the same techniques that you use in order to resist temptation generally, right? But here's the interesting thing, right? The professor who did this experiment, his daughter was at the same school, or his, he had two daughters. These two daughters were at the same school as the kids who had participated in the experiment. And his daughters would come back from school and say, oh, Tommy did this. 
and Sarah did that, and Jane did this. And then he started noticing something really interesting. That there was a correlation or a connection between the kids who are getting into trouble. Right? He noticed that the kids that were constantly getting into trouble were the same kids who had been unable to resist temptation. The same kids who had given in and eaten the marshmallow straight away were the same kids who ended up... And, and here's the thing. They followed these kids through school, into college, through their adulthood, because anyway, most of them didn't even end up going to college. In fact, most of these kids who couldn't resist temptation, not only did they not go to college, they ended up being more likely to be drug addicts, alcoholics, have low income jobs or be totally unemployed to go to prison. Like everything you could think about, the bad things in society, these same kids who had failed the test of being able to resist temptation were the same ones who were following all these bad patterns throughout life. And the kids who had been able to resist temptation, right, they were the ones, right, who had... You know, better jobs, stable marriages, happy homes, like whatever, you know, all the benchmark of what you could call a success balanced life. And here's the crazy thing. Like contrary to what you might imagine, there is almost nothing that statistically happens in a kid's life that actually goes on to indicate how the... So, like, there are things that happen in kids' lives, right? Maybe it might be divorce, right? It may be some traumatic experience, it may be sexual abuse, it may be a whole range of things, right? But what is interesting is, the outcome of kids who suffer from these things, there's not any necessary correlation. They don't find, it's very few things they find that if a kid goes through this, they turn out like that as an adult. Do you understand? Right? You may think that if a kid is sexually abused, they're going to be like such and such. But actually, there's nothing statistically very significant, contrary to what we might think. It doesn't excuse it. I'm just saying the range of outcomes are so wide, you can't really predict how a kid's going to be from the way they behave when they're young. Except this one thing. Their ability to resist temptation. Their ability to delay gratification. Now the thing is that this is something you can train. This is something you can develop. You can develop it within yourself. And you can develop it within the character and the personality of your kids. 